episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Welcome to episode 98 of the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. Also, if you're listening in real time, Happy New Year, Connected Yoga Teachers. Welcome to 2019. This interview with Gil Headley is one that made me laugh a lot. You're going to hear that. But it also made me think about fascia, anatomy, and scar tissue in a whole new light. I have to tell you, when I talk with a podcast guest, I like to check in at the start of our call and ask things like, do you have any questions before we begin the interview? And Gil is the very first person to say, no, not at all. I have no idea who you are or what we're really talking about today. And it made me laugh and it was humbling in a really refreshing way. You see, let me back things up a little bit. I've been a fan of Gil Headley since I first saw the Fuzz video, but he's never heard of me or this podcast. And for those of you who don't know Gil, he made the Fuzz video, but he also is known for many other things. He's a rolfer, an author, and he encourages somanauts. I'm going to let him explain what that term is. He encourages somanauts to explore the wonders of the human form through hands-on human dissection courses in the lab and in lecture presentations. Huge shout out to a couple of our listeners who took the time to leave a review. We really appreciate that. And I try and read one or two of them on the podcast each and every week. So thank you to Kathleen Pratt, who left a review in our Facebook group. Kathleen said, this Facebook group is like my yoga buddy, a place I can turn to with questions, doubts, and high fives in my yoga business. It's a living example of Asteya and a place where people give freely of their time and knowledge to help other yoga teachers on their journey. Thank you, Shannon, for creating this safe space. It is a beautiful companion to the podcast, which also rates number one in my book. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. It means so much that you say that because that was my vision with the Facebook group. And if you're not sure what Kathleen's talking about for the Facebook group and you're a yoga teacher, come over and join us. If you go to the connectedyogateacher.com, you'll see the join button right on our homepage. We got another review from ARPKR from Canada. That's an iTunes review. So I'm reading a handle, a username I don't have other than ARPKR. And they said, how thoughtful and informative. The content is all things I have wondered about. It is so inclusive and welcoming. I really enjoy this podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really excited that you are enjoying the podcast. If you're new here, hi and welcome. My name is Shannon Crow. I'm a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant working for yoga teachers. This podcast was created for you, so you can connect to information and inspiration every week and feel supported as you navigate the jungles of yoga entrepreneurship. And I just want to ask, how are those jungles right now? If you're listening in real time, we're in the new year, and I feel like so many people are jumping on the like, let's go to yoga and let's get fit and be healthy <laughs> and let's do our New Year's resolutions. So I wonder if you're seeing an increase in your classes. I wonder if you're feeling a little stressed or maybe you had a great break at the holidays and you're ready to go. Today's episode is one of those that you can listen to on the go and learn about fascia and think about movement and scar tissue and the body. So I'm super excited that you can listen as you're traveling back and forth from class, walking your dogs, doing your cleaning, all the things that you do. Many of you tell me that you do listen on the go. And so if you do, our show notes are ready for you with all of the links. You just have to go to the connectedyogateacher.com slash 98 to find them. Before we meet Gil, let's hear our hot tip of the week from our team at Schedulicity. Hey, Connected Yoga Teachers, this is Anna with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Schedulicity is pleased to present improvements to our class booking feature. We worked with yoga businesses to find out what they really needed to make their business more successful and less stressful. Together, we developed group booking, online waivers, wait lists, and client alerts to help you manage the needs of your students and grow as a business. If you've been wondering how an online scheduler can help you specifically as a business, we'd love to tell you more. Email us anytime at support at schedulicity.com or visit schedulicity.com for more information and a chat with one of our support rock stars. Thank you so much, Schedulicity. 
Alrighty, let's dive in and meet Gil. Gil Headley has his doctorate in theological ethics from the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. In the early 90s, he became a certified rolfer at the Rolf Institute in Boulder, Colorado. He also studied massage and tai chi. And since then, Gil has developed an integral approach to the study of human anatomy. He has also published a number of books and produced the Integral Anatomy series, which is a set of four feature-length videos documenting the whole body, layer by layer, through on-camera dissection. As you are going to hear, Gil is super passionate about anatomy and has a gift for sharing all of his passion through story and unique ideas, as well as tons of information. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Gil. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Shannon. I'm happy to chat with you. So what started this journey, do you think? Oh, well, you're asking for a cause and an effect. So that's impossible because the universe is continuous. <laughs> so uh, Anyway, I was uh, a fairly disembodied intellectual in graduate school, started doing Tai Chi, realized I had a body and that it worked wanted to be in it and systematically approached my life in a way that got, got me not floating around two feet above my head, but all the way in me down to my feet. Good stuff. Well, I'm really thankful because I feel like when I first watched the fuzz video, it's like you took anatomy, which I was basically learning out of books and from teachers and you made it really um, something more dynamic. And it wasn't that I wasn't used to dissection. So I had went through for a veterinary technician and we had to dissect cats and pigs. Uh, but you have a real gift for sharing that uh, excitement about anatomy and to bring it to life. So can you tell me about a couple of things, this somanauts? I made up that word actually to describe um, a, a prima somanaut, uh, Emily Conrad. She was Emily Conrad Daoud at the time, the founder of Continuum, uh, a movement form, uh, which you may or may not have heard of, but she was a wonderful healer and teacher and mover and dancer. And I interviewed her 25 years ago when I was the editor of the Rolf Lines Journal, the Journal of the Rolf Institute. And uh, I went to her with my little tape recorder and sat with her for a couple hours and we had the most wonderful conversation ever and I didn't turn it on. <laughs> so I was like, oh, dang, I got to write an article. Um, and so I, I was like, how do I describe this incredible person? She's incredibly embodied. She travels in her body. So she's like, so I thought body, soma is the rich word for body in Greek, as opposed to sarx, which was just reference the flesh. So soma is kind of a rich word for the body. And nought is like to sail or navigate, so like a sailor and like nautical, you know, all those root words. So a somonaut is someone who navigates the body, who sails the inner seas. And if you go deep enough into that ocean, you'll bump into the astronauts because they're sailing around as well. <laughs> oh, well, I love it. It's really fascinating. Now, I mainly want to talk about fascia today. Okay. And so right off the top do you feel like there's anything that you wish that movers humans beings and educators of movement if you wish oh i wish people understood fascia in this way mm, well for me for movers fascia is key if you i feel have no conception of what's going on inside your body it's a little trickier to embody what's going on inside your body Fascia being a key to movement, I think it's good to learn about that. So it's really about learning the, the textures, you know, not words. <laughs> words are exhausting <laughs> for the brain and they slow down movement. Go on, try and think about dancing while you're dancing. You'll ruin it. So uh, <laughs> we don't want to know too many words and get lost in words. But um, textures are a nice thing we can connect to kinesthetically. And, uh, and if we, um, you know, do something as simple as put our hands on our skin, 
you know, and just press in ever so slightly. You'll see it's a little spongy. And that's a first layer of fascia. That's superficial fascia, it's the fatty layer. And then if you take that whole, whole skin complex and move it up and down on your arm, slidey, slidey, what enables it to slide is another type of fascia. I called it fuzz for a long time, and then I called it filmy fascia, but now I call it perifascia because anatomists can understand that better. Um, anyone can understand it. It's the fascia around the fascia. So, so the slippery layer is filmy fascia or perifascia. The spongy layer is that adipose, the subcutaneous adipose or superficial fascia. But then if you go through both of those and you press your fingertips into your arm and it gets to kind of a, a dense, bouncy layer, it's the deep fascia. So that's a bit more strappy. It has more organ, organized, regular arrays of collagen fibers. And so it's that simple to feel, even your own forearm you know, these different layers, they each have different movement properties. They don't do the same thing for your movement. So if you connect to, to them either to touch, to move them with your hands, or to move them in space, uh, you can actually orient, you know, to the different layers. Not that they're separate and not that they're layers. <laughs> don't get me wrong. This is just a story, right? You got one body many textures, differential movement, without any separation. Yeah, that's. I feel like that's something that we want to do when we study anatomy. We really want to have really concrete lines, kind of like the world and countries and borders. <laughs> well, exactly. That's a, that's a headspace. It's something that words and knives both do. Right? right, they separate, they differentiate. There's no nothing wrong with noticing differences. That's fun. That's um, the creative process is to generate, notice difference. Right, and then we say, "Ooh, the subtle green versus the darker green on the hillside when you're painting uh, the grass over Loch Ness." You know, uh, so it, it's it's a wonderful thing to appreciate difference. But when you appreciate differences with the heart. They remain connected, right? Because the heart is infiltrating everything within and without and surrounding and embracing. But if you go to the headspace, then you're like, oh, that's uh, this kind of, this is cerulean blue as opposed to sky blue as opposed to, to, to you know, uh, and you start naming things and putting them in boxes and different tubes. And, and, and then it's not that anymore. It's a different thing. Um, so in terms of anatomy, if we, we can approach the body, I like to do it by color, shape, texture, without so many words, uh, because that puts you into that heart space that allows for embodiment, connection, meaning, uh, meanings, type of meanings, as opposed to vocabulary, um, definitions. S separations, boxes, death. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? If you put your body in a box, that's a very grave thing. <laughs> it's so true. This is maybe something that is unique to the way you share anatomy. I feel like even when you describe this superficial layer of fascia, and also called the adipose layer. I feel like when I learn that from you, I learn a lot even just about body acceptance. There's a lot more, this, this thinking of things through the headspace and then also integrating the heart space. Do you want to talk about just that superficial layer in that way? Sure. I always invite people when they're wanting to learn about the gift of the body to start with a place of appreciation, right? Because rather than what you think you know about it and how you feel about it already, which is probably, that's fat and I hate it, right? In other words, now job done, nothing more to talk about. Oh, let's move on. Get that in the bucket really quick. Well, wait a second, wait a second. Slow down, baby. <laughs> you know, if, if, we, if we slow down and appreciate the color, the texture, 
the, the physiological functions. This is a complex, sophisticated, beautiful, intelligent organ that's working for you your whole life, uh, doing only wonderful <laughs> things like hugging. I mean, where would we be without hugging, you know? And <laughs> we don't just want to hug clattery <laughs> people. We're like, a little flesh is nice to grab onto, right? So, um, so our superficial fascia, we can, we can approach it from a place of appreciation and say, oh, this is a, a sensual fleece around our body. It's not just fat. You know? I mean, the fat's like a curse word in our culture, right? So that's yes. why I call it superficial fascia, just to get out of the headspace of fat by definition and hate that. Right? So if we go to superficial fascia, well, everybody loves fascia. You know, it's all sexy right now. Everyone's talking about <laughs> So we talk about superficial fashion, suddenly people will like pause and pay attention for a few seconds long enough to say, oh, did you know that adipocytes are connective tissue cells? Do you know that they can be suspended in a, in a, in a matrix that is, is, um, is having all sorts of functions, specialty functions like the mammary glands live there. We nourish and feed our babies there and they rest on it to sleep and cuddle. Right, so that that's nice. What about um, you know? What about its its function as a great endocrine gland? You know, it it is that. In other words, as sure as the uh, short sighted anatomist chucks it in a bucket, the uh, endocrinologist takes it out of the bucket and says, "Oh, these cells are producing hormones that are regulating." metabolism with the pancreas, you know, burn and store fat along with the pancreas, which is also saying burn and store fat. So there's this beautiful dance going on between the superficial fascia and the pancreas uh, with regard to your metabolism. So we have an organism, an endocrine organ that's an organ of metabolism. We have a, an organ that's, uh, that's nourishing. We have an organ that's contractile. So it's protective in that way. If you get slashed with a saber, have you ever watched Game of Thrones? It happens all the time. <laughs> so if you get slashed with a saber, that's not the end because that superficial fascia will start to pulse. It's fill, full of smooth muscle fibers and will start to pulse to close the wound and approximate its edges so that the healing can occur, right? So we have this uh, uh, a healing fleece um, surrounding our, our, our deeper structures. Um, I can go on and on. Well, there's one more that I'd love for you to include in this. And that is that I saw a video where you talked about intuition and our superficial fascia. Mm, well, what rank speculative hogwash that must have been, <laughs> uh, which is pretty much what most folks say about most things I talk about, but that's okay. I'm a storyteller, and uh, I feel that if, if, you're, if a story provokes you to deeper thought and appreciation, then it's a good story. You should tell it. So that particular story I got from studying deeper into the body at the kidneys, so look at kidneys, they're very interesting. They're like many people, right? It's like a little homunculus, a little person down there in that little kidney shape, it's like a little fetus, right? And, and the kidney curled up with its little umbilical cord, the, 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 the ureter uh, coming out of it, you know, is, is like this little, this little person and it also is surrounded in fat. So we have like cocoons or sleeves of fat in our bodies. One on the outside, we call that the superficial fascia. And then we have around our organ system, the, the mesocolon and the transverse mesocolon and the, and, the, and the greater omentum forming like a spherical shell around your guts. So we have the superficial fascia on the outside. Then we have this sphere of, of fat around our organs. And then we go to the kidney itself and it lives in this shell, this inner shell of fat called the subserosal fascia. So, guess who lives on the subserosal fascia? The adrenal gland. Right. Now, if you look in Netter and you see like this funny little, you know, uh, pioneer cap on top of the kidney, it doesn't draw the fat. So everybody thinks the adrenal gland lives adrenal on the renal. Well, that's how they named it, but it's not quite right. Uh, it's really the ad. Fat gland. It, 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 the, the, the adrenal gland is 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 
like a little um, creature that's attached to the fat around the kidney. Uh, gro they're grown together with a great corona of interesting little vessels and nerves and such that root into that subserosal fascia around the kidney. And I'm thinking, cool, wow, the adrenal glands are really into the fat. That's so interesting. And then I think, well, maybe it's like a set of tuning forks. Maybe that's how our body works. Maybe when you strike, have you ever struck a tuning fork and held it close to another tuning fork? That second tuning fork will start to resonate. So I started thinking, well, our adrenal glands are listening to our environment and we're responding with hormonal and neural responses, cascades of information flowing through our body when the adrenal glands are activated in a fight, flight, or freeze uh, situation, right? So I'm thinking, well, it's not always so dramatic. It's listening all the time. We're listening all the time to our environment. How do we do it? Oh, we have a puddle, this wet, sloppy, wonderful yellow fleece around our body. Maybe that's the first tuning fork if it's struck by the perturbations of our external environment, right? right. Then it's, it's set into a vibration that then echoes down deep through those shells that are similar to it, the same tuned frequency, the same fork vibrates to the same fork, right? So if you have an A fork and an A fork and you strike one A, the other one will co-vibrate. If you strike one fat shell, all the fat shells are gonna co-vibrate. The fat around your eyeball, around your heart, the fat around your kidney, <laughs> viscera, are gonna co-vibrate with the striking of that outer shell. This is a story. and. Then the adrenal gland picks up on that vibration. It's like, oh, I know what that means. We'd better turn our head and run. We, uh, you know, let's confirm it with the neocortex. Sure enough, scary person on the sidewalk. I'm out of here, right? Now it might be true or it might not be true, but you're going to run either way, <laughs> right? Right. So, so or the, the nice person on the other side of the sidewalk, and it's like you're just walking along, minding your own business, and you and you turn your head. And, there he is. <laughs> you know, so, um, so how about that? Uh, so I'm just, you know, thinking maybe that's how the adrenal gland listens to the much more external environment. Maybe it's catching catching a wave from the superficial fashion. I appreciate that you bring story into anatomy. I think that I've also studied with teachers who can make it really dry. Super or dry. if I read a textbook, <laughs> it could be really dry. And then, and then there are the stories that really help us to, to learn it and to ask more questions. And so all of this is happening in our superficial fascia. What about the next layer of fascia, the deeper fascia, the, the one that you said is more slide and glide or that you oh, call? the slippery one. Yeah, that's the one I've been calling of late perifascia. So perifascia, I'm super excited about uh, for like a long time now, and it keeps changing names on me. <laughs> so when I first do, started doing dissection, I really didn't look at the books very carefully. And even if I did, the information would not have been in there uh, because, you know, they draw all these pretty pictures of muscles and stuff uh, in the books, and they don't draw this stuff. They don't draw cotton candy. You know, so you go to a fixed form. You know, one that's embalmed, an embalmed cadaver, and start dissecting, start pulling it apart, and there's all this cotton candy. It's like, what's with the cotton candy? That wasn't in the book. Uh, so I had to make up a story, right, about the cotton candy. Uh, I called it fuzz. And I was like, I'm not sure what it's doing here. Now, I really wasn't sure at the, at, the, at the first glance. I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, maybe this is accidental glue that doesn't belong here. <laughs> um, you know, I was a rolfer and I was being taught to differentiate tissues with my hands. That was the kind of language that we used back then. Right. And so I thought, okay, here I am in the lab differentiating tissues. Is this what I do in my rolfing practice? I, I disrupt fuzz and make it go away, dissolve like candy melting in your mouth. That's what I thought. You know, but that wasn't true. That wasn't true at all. <laughs> that was an illusion. That was a mistake. You know, uh, what it turned out after, you know, and by the time I did the fuzz speech, I already knew that. I mean, I've been doing it for 10 years already. I knew that this fuzz was really a film, you know, and that it only was fuzzy when you pulled it apart. 
So okay. if, you left it, if you left it in place, you know, of course, in dissection, you're pulling things apart. So you see them distorted, torn, you know, it's trauma, right? So fuzz is, is, is a, a, a film being pulled apart. And it turns out that the film is structured, you know, you know with a, a collagen array that's very chaotic and mixed up. So it looks like cotton candy when you pull it apart. If you don't pull it apart, then it's, it's a layer rather than a pile of fuzz. And if you work, instead of working on a fixed form that's been fixed by formalin and therefore desiccated, dried out, right? Turned crispy, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you work on a wet body, which I started to realize because some of my cadavers weren't really that well embalmed, you know? so they were kind of wet. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then I was like, well, let me go to the full Monty here and start working with bodies that have no fixatives that are just preserved by refrigeration, right? So if you start working with bodies that, that aren't desiccated, then you start to see that fuzz, that filmy fascia in place and functioning. It's still functioning in the dead. You can, you can move, you can see tissues are able to move because of that, not in spite of it, but because of it. And that that wet, super hydrated, slippery, filmy fascia is actually a movement function in our body, in, in part, it's not the whole story. Superficial fascia has got to move too. Everything's got to move. If it ain't right. moving, it's dead, right? Right. So, but it's just a question of how does that tissue move? We can get back to superficial fascia moving a, a little later, but for now, let's just say that this, this layer, this, this slippery layer, that I now call perifashion can be more or less slippery in the living. Right. And why is yeah. that? Well, like anything, it changes with use. So it's a user looted, lose it function, right? Because you're sitting on your butt, darling. You're just sitting there. I see you. You're sitting on your butt. <laughs> But it's going fuzzy right now. It's, going, it's, it's what, what happens is, is that you get heat buildup when there's pressure on tissue. Heat is inflammation, right? Under conditions of inflammation, the chemistry of the tissue changes. It moves, not in an instant, but it moves in the direction from slippery towards gummy. It's a chemical phenomenon, just like caramelizing onions in a pan right. have you ever done that yes is it not delicious it is so the good news is the less you move the more you suffer but the better you taste <laughs> so, <laughs> how about that? so you have to you have to um the kinds of phenomena that happen chemically in the tissues Right? when you're not using them, include hydrogen bonding and cross-linking of fibers. Our little elastin fibers, for instance, are studded with hydrogen, but they're, they're having like a little bubble around them, a little chemistry bubble. But that doesn't have to be. You can break through that bubble and all those little hydrogens will start linking up with the surrounding collagen fibers and mucopolysaccharides. And you'll and you'll and the tissue can become dehydrated. So if you get dehydration, fiber cross-linking, hydrogen bonding happening in the tissues, its texture is losing slipperiness by the day. Right. Right? So how can those we... changes are permanent? Okay. Right? They can, you can unlink them. You can rehydrate them. You can deagglomerate them. You can melt them. Melt your fashion. And so, do we do that through movement, hydration, breath, massage? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Anything else that I'm missing? You're, you're, you're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> grounding there's another one yeah 
Through grounding. Yeah, because when you have inflammation in your tissues and all those agglomerative processes that are taking place, you're also having an accumulation of protons. It's like a proton pool, which is the effect of the, uh, of the uh, what do you call it, the uh, oxidative stresses. So inflammatory, play, inflamed, glued up places, you have a lot of protein, I'm sorry, protons swimming around in there. And the earth, thank goodness, who would have thought to put us on one? Uh, the earth is, is covered with a pool of electrons. How, how convenient to tap with your flesh and conduct through your connective tissue matrix and deliver to that pool of protons and neutralize it. Does that so, mean I have to be walking barefoot outside though? Because I live like it's going to start snowing here next week. Damn, girl, you got to <laughs> get get. Where do you live and why? <laughs> Stop it. Go somewhere else. Three <laughs> hours, three hours north of Toronto, and so we ski. And- you live at the North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So. Oh my God. Am I talking to a Canadian? Yeah. Is that where I miss then? I miss the sunshine? Is that why? That might be why. That's something. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm coughing on Florida air. <laughs> it's so warm, <laughs> moist, and refreshing. Uh, I, um, you know, if you can't ground yourself barefoot that way, you can cheat. <laughs> You know, you can put a grounding mat around your massage table. You can ground yourself artificially. Stick a copper tube in the ground outside, right? Touch a wire to it. Run it. I, I went and got. I went to Home Depot. And I got like a, you know, some uh, what do you call it? aluminum screening, like for a screen door. And you get some aluminum screening. Attach the copper wire through it. I kind of sewed it, like when you're making your own, like when you're a kid and you're and you're and you're making a um, like a pot holder. Did you yes. ever do that when you were little? Wasn't that fun? <laughs> so you make a pot holder, but you do it with aluminum screening and copper. It's really cheap. You can go online and buy this stuff too. But of course, I'm kind of a luddite. I like to make my own stuff. So you you make your you make a little mat and you and you can stand on it. And if you hold a you know, you can you can test and see if you're grounded with uh, electrical instruments, and it, it absolutely works. Hmm. Um, I, I did it with sheets and then slept on them, but sleeping on aluminum screening is just sucks, you know. <laughs> so I was like, I think I'll just move to Florida and go barefoot. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, then I got my feet all cut up because I I live in a kind of a drunken, brawly sort of neighborhood, and um, so there's always broken bottles and stuff so i was like oh this is terrible i can't walk barefoot around here uh so i go to the beach (laughs) right (laughs) you know but it's like you know my grandpa walks outside in the snow in his bare feet and he's in his so now we're talking maybe that's a real man he's my hero he goes to get the mail yeah what a smart guy how cool is that because the thing is you know we we have uh we pussyfoot around, don't we? We we uh, we've gotten to be tender tender feet. Yes. But it wasn't always so. We used to wear our moccasins on our feet. In other words, your feet will grow moccasins if you walk on them enough. Yeah. Right. And they're still conductive. Yeah. Um, I mean, those barefoot, uh, you know, um, First Nations people who could run a hundred miles didn't get their feet torn up, right? Because they had and, and we have we have folks here in Melbourne, Florida, who do the bare, or we have a local marathon. They do it barefoot. It's quite amazing. That's amazing. So this yeah. helps our fascia. How? How by by conducting the 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 inflammatory proton pools out of it that are being stored there and enabling you to be neutral with the earth. That's that's it's just to, to lower inflammation. That's amazing. You know, I mean, dogs walk around on four feet. How smart is that? Right. You know, or if if a wild animal is sick, it curls up on the ground. 
right? It maximizes its contact with the ground to, to draw the inflammation out of its body. This is why I feel better when I'm out in the garden then. Absolutely. Gardening is the healthiest thing you can do. Don't yeah. run barefoot marathons. Just go outside <laughs> and garden, right? Because you got the color therapy. You got the, the local food thing going on. You got the immune system purification happening from those blessed, wonderful, necessary ultraviolet rays right. that everybody hates and protects themselves from as if it's like murder from the sky. You know, no, no, those, those, those UV rays are, are, your blood is passing through your eyeballs, through the capillaries, and is, when exposed to the ultraviolet light is getting a cleansing, just like you do to surgical instruments under ultraviolet light in a tray at a hospital, or just like you do at a municipal water purification system that's shining ultraviolet light on the water. We're just imitating our eyeballs right. outside. That's amazing. Right? So we're off the topic of fascia, though. So we might want <laughs> to okay, come though. on, come on We're going to get outside. We're going to get outside. We could move outside. Get outside. Okay. Even if you're Canadian. And so then what about the next layer of fascia? Because you talked about three, I feel oh, like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that one we call maybe dense regular fibrous fascia or deep fascia. So deep by location relative to the other two. Right, so deep, deep fascia, that's cool stuff. Is that the stuff that is striated or like? Yeah, or... yeah, that's okay. the famous stuff. That's what everyone, everyone uses the word fascia, that's what they're talking about. Right. They're talking about that one because that one is a famous fascia. It's easy to study. It's, it's easy to find once you've thrown that fat in the bucket and scraped that film. <laughs> away you can see that deep fascia and it's easy to get to and it's not gross <laughs> so right. so people who don't like stuff that could kind of get kind of slippery and gross would rather go to that nice organized strappy strapping tape pretty silver salmon belly fascia that who wouldn't love that right i mean any mother would love that child right? This funny looking one over here, we're not so sure about, but whoa, that handsome one, let's go with that. So there's sort of a, there's sort of a prejudice, you know, there's a prejudicial favoritism towards deep fashion. Um, that's okay. I get it. I understand. Whatever. <laughs> no. However, uh, and it is super cool stuff. It's, it's like the superficial fascia. It's contractile in its own right. It's full of myofibroblasts, more or less, depending upon where you are. Right. Um, that that slowly change the tension in that fabric so that it can hold a position without tiring forever. What about when we have an injury? Like, say, for instance, I'll just use myself here. So I had my appendix out and also had two cesareans with my babies. So what happens to the fascia? Which fascia uh, layer is affected? Are all of them affected? Well, it, for your cesareans, you had to, you know, a knife passed through all of those layers to get into your, you know, pelvic space. And, and really, from abdom abdominal space, they're going to do it and, and access your, your, your uh, uterus, right? So um, they come at it from a, a little above, right? It depends, really, but uh, on the surgeon, but they changed the style. Anyway, they had to go cut through your skin, cut through your superficial fascia, cut through your films, cut through your deep fascia. Now, when they stitch it all back up, thank goodness, right, because you definitely need some help stitching that back up in the sh, in the sh, really, to do it quick, right? So they're going to stitch up your deep fascia, and maybe they'll stitch up your superficial fascia, maybe. Depends on the surgeon, you know, mood. Uh, right. you know, and, and then they're going to stitch your skin up. So your fat will blissfully grow back together unless it doesn't, right? <laughs> if they stitch it together, that's nice. If they don't stitch it together, you might get a little gap there, a little trench right. running along where your scar is, uh, where the superficial fascia wasn't able to completely heal across the, the divide. Um, the deep fascia in its stitches right will maybe 
the pressure will sort of squeak out the ends. I often see little herniations at either end of a deep fascia scar. Right. You know, because that'll be the weak point in the system. The weak point isn't where the stitches are. It's where the stitches stopped, right? So so there'll be pot potential for minor herniation there. Um, you know, and your skin will heal up real nice. But if the skin scar sticks to the deep fascia scar, then there'll be a the superficial fascia can't cross that fusion, right? And you'll end up a little a little hilly and ballot you, but consider that the red badge of courage for your beautiful gift to the world of <laughs> bring your children into it. Thank you. And, and you know. And so yeah. then is there anything we can do for that scar tissue in terms of the fascia that's around it? And particularly I, well, I just think the superficial layer, like, does it you then pull? You want to get your slippery back. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so you, you, that, that's what you're going for, right? So, so it's, it's, you, scars are good. Scars are a blessing. Scars represent our healing function, right? So every time you meet that scar, say thank you first, right? So again, start with appreciation. Right, because the same function that scars your tissue, that's the same one that turns you gummy when you're not moving. Right. In other words, all that, that's just, that's the same thing happening there. In other words, it's like, why do my tissues go gummy when I don't use them? Well, because that's, that's uh, your heal, your healer on retainer is waiting for you to be injured and, and gum you up. Right, so. But you can't just let it run roughshod in your life. You have to. You have to keep moving. We're like sharks. We gotta. We gotta keep moving, uh, or we're gonna suffocate in our own suit. So, the, the a scar is. It's not about getting rid of a scar, being mad at a scar, being unhappy with a scar. It's about mobilizing the scar. It's about increasing its its pliability. It's about welcoming its slipperiness to the surrounding tissues. Right, because it's like any still point, it tends to increase, and so scars grow, you know, especially visceral scars, right? Because it's way slippery in there. So, so the, if you create a still point, stuff will move, start to move around it, and that sphere of around will get bigger, right? And and scars will will progress. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't regress. Right. Also. They can, but get get on it. You get on it uh, earlier rather than later. Ten years from now it would be later, <laughs> um, right? So, and many people just never. They're like, oh, that that thing there. Oh, I hate that. I don't like that. That was a bad time. That was a hard experience, and they back off from the injured place, and and create pools of psychical distance, right? which then create pools of, of disuse, which then create agglomeration and more of what you didn't like in the first place. So it, whatever, if you approach your body in a heavy, dark, hateful way, you're always going to get more of that back, right? In other words, and if you approach it with appreciation, love, and a desire for more slipperiness in, in your life, then, then you, you, you're going to get that. Right. I really like yeah. how you brought this in, like to first approach the scar with a feeling of gratitude. Yeah, that's great. Heck, it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, with no scar, you're dead. That's right. Like, so end of story. No complaining then. <laughs> <Is there? laughs> like, what was the last thing she said? <laughs> I don't want to have a scar. <laughs> Fine. Don't have a scar. Goodbye. <laughs> right, right. Um, is there anything else that you have learned recently or learned over the years about fascia that feels like it's the most fascinating thing? Or do you have questions that are still unanswered about fascia? Do I? Yeah, I don't know anything about fascia. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know nothing. I have like three words, three textures. I got no science for you. Sorry, got to go to other smarter people for that. <laughs> you know, I, I, in other words, there, I would, yeah, I would like to know. I would like some grad student out there to tell me to spend eight years of their life messing around with um, uh, the Perry fashion, you know, and tell me, you know, I can bounce my, 
I can stretch out a bit of a sheet of it and bounce my scalpel handle off of it. So tell me exactly, you know, what are the proportions of collagen and elastin? What are the proportions of hyaluronic acid and mucopolysaccharides in that tissue? Uh, what nerves go to it and what special functions do they have? Are there special nerve organs that live in the filmy fascia that I don't know about? I would like to know all those things. Better than that would be to have so thoroughgoingly inhabited my form that I'm just like a jellyfish, <laughs> but a jellyfish that can activate, right? Right. Because that's really the design, you know, not to be kind of lumpy and grizzly here. And it's like, we're like these jellyfish that can go do all of a sudden do iron shirt, qigong, shazam, <laughs> and like swing a bat or, you know, run down the block and get the mail or make love of it. You know, we have all of these to be able to access the whole gift in movement. There's a, there's a way to go. To be able to move and and to have the body ready to move, but also to have that jellyfish, like I want to say that's the tissues of the body coming more into the relaxation. Exactly. Yeah. In other words, there's, there's always a balance. I don't mean I want to be a blob on a <laughs> side cooking in the sun. We have a lot of like jellyfish that didn't make it around here. But um, it, I say that to, only to say that we have um, some of our musculature is on all the time for no good reason. Our, we, we're, we're like we're working and getting nothing done and we're tired because our body isn't being used efficiently. Right. Right. <clears throat> On top of that, through patterns of the way that we are embedded in our culture and our families and our workplaces and our mental structures, we turn a switch off on whole areas of our body and then they get kind of gummy and we never use them. They can even go crystalline, and that really is like not good. Right. So, just have something that tastes the best. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's for our meat eater listeners out there. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Right. All you bet. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not at all because the same exact same phenomenon happens when you use ghee and onions. Right. And, Right, that Maillard reaction in a pan that creates that caramelized thing, though that is the exact same process of crystallization happening in your body. So I'm serious; it tastes that's better. <laughs> yeah. So it's the Maillard reaction. That's 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 that's, that's famous in cooking, not so famous in anatomy, thankfully. Because I mean, well, back in I mean, golly, you look read read, uh, you know. Uh, what was his name? John, John Hunter, the knife man from the 18th century England. Uh, he was uh, really the father of modern surgery and an amazing anatomist who discovered all kinds of wonderful things that we still know today and don't know why we know them because someone like that figured it out for us. But yeah, he, he was like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Scotsman. There's a briny taste. <laughs> Dude, put that down. Get some gloves. Oh, cow. Yeah. He was really being the scientist. <laughs> yeah, that's more science than I care for. Them. Well, I'm looking forward to when you master this, this like jellyfish, and then you'll have to tell us oh, when you get you there. haven't you seen me move? I'm definitely getting there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, it's more about palpation. Like when you touch, you know, yeah. if you touch flesh that isn't being, doing something, it should be kind of, liquidy how does, how does so we know that movement helps how about massage is there oh that's good yeah yeah is there a is there something that it offers that movement can't yeah <laughs> so <laughs> i mean have you ever seen people move they move in ruts yes right people are like i'll do i'll move these 10 ways but not that 11th way no way otherwise no one will do that. <laughs> like, why won't they do that? Because it's culturally unacceptable. Right. 
lots of movements have been ruled culturally unacceptable, unacceptable socially inappropriate. Um, what would my mother say, you know, if I move like that? Or, or, or I'm on the dance floor, oh, this is what cool dancing looks like, right? right. But what does friggin' unpatterned movement look like? Irregular movement, right? Unconventionally bizarre movement. You know, because this is that's how you're going to access more. Yes, right? because All I can if you just of- like doing the breaststroke, fifty thousand strokes a day, that's gonna move. Something's gonna move, but something else isn't gonna move. Right, right. Mix it up. You know, how about the crawl? How about the butterfly? How about anything but that? You know, backstroke. Give us. You know, in other words, or or when you're dancing, are you just? I mean, go to high school these days. Oh my lord, my my son is <laughs> in high school and and dancing where you know a boy goes like this and a girl grinds her lap on his lap i mean like well that's not dancing like move around a little bit mix it up um so that in other words even in our dancing even in our yoga even in our pilates in in our in our what have you in our you know we're in movement ruts like oh this is what the perfect asana looks like i will assume the perfect asana and yeah so um, so now you're Galui Asana. Congratulations. Yeah. You know, do that, do that, do that Asana because they have their purpose, right? But don't think you've moved because right. you went through that sequence of postures. I had all my students rolling on the floor last night, and that's there all you. we were doing is really just rolling around. Awesome. Contact improv, right? <laughs> That's it. Now roll over each other. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep on rolling. Roll right out the door. You know. Because- and then we also did chair pose, but we I'm I got them to move their feet in all different positions and they were really skeptical. Like, why should we do that? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I know. I was like, this is exactly why. This is this is this I was just like that when I was a Tai Chi guy. Right. Tai Chi for seven years. And I moved in certain ways. And those certain ways ultimately became a limit cycle on the potential of my body, no longer expanding it. And I was, if you can do all your 20 asanas or your 100 asanas or your 500 asanas, you know, at some point they will become a movement rut. Right. Right. And you got to do something else because that's a mental shape, not a body shape. Mm hmm. Right. That's a, um, that's a mental shape. It's not an organic thing. It's a construct imposed on your body. I got nothing against it, but I know its limits. Right. Right. And I'm not going to tell myself, "Ooh, I got my workout because I went to yoga class. Yeah. Tape a pencil to your coccyx and write a letter. <laughs> and tell me if you if you don't have a different life by the time you go. Right. So how is it that you don't don't don't, don't do that? <laughs> <laughs> Children at home, put the put the pencil down. <laughs> stop. Stop it. How how is it that you invite new movements in then? Because I think we are we can easily get into a habit. You gotta crush your dogmas. And I'm speaking about that in a that word extremely broadly applied. Right. So I'm not just talking about religious dogmas. You think like culturally (laughs) everything you think is true. Everything, you know, you question it. Every emotion you've practiced, try another one. You know, (laughs) in other words, they're in an emotional rut or they're sad. They're still sad. Well, you could be sad for a while, but honestly, do something else. Now, in other words, we have a range of emotions, emotions, right? Ex movio, it's the movement out from sensation. That's what emotions are. You have a sensation and then you ex movio, you move out from the body into the world with expression. Right. Right. That's what emotion is. It's, 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 it's having, a, you have an internal sensation, like all of a sudden there's like all this heat and quivering and you're like, Whoa! right. And that's the. That's the emotional expression, and cultures read that. In some other cultures, they'd be like, no, you're not allowed to do that. Suck it up, you know? 
So right. you have those sensations and that means hold on in a certain way. In another culture, the sensation means let go in a certain way, right? If so you go somewhere else, it means flail your arms around and punch a couch and it just depends on where you are, right? So, so we gotta explore to, to, if you want to move differently, you have to move out differently. You, know, you have to allow there to be a range of emotion you have to permit a range of sensation. And then you have to try them on differently. You just can't put one outfit on every time you have that sensation. It's like, oh, I'm feeling sexy. I'm going to wear my slinky dress again. You know, but on the 14th date, you're like, oh, Lord, is she in my slinky dress again? It's just not sexy anymore, you know? So you, in other words, it's a variety. <laughs> That's amazing. Again, you still bring in like you you continue to bring in that emotional side with the intellectual side. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for all of your time. I know that you have a lot of videos online. There are some there that are free. There are some paid courses. Buy those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buy the ones that are paid. Yeah, like people just keep taking. Come on, buy something. Come on. <laughs> People are like, well, stop giving stuff away. And it's a <laughs> service. Yeah, it's a service for sure. Thank you for offering that. And then also thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. I had a blast. And I had no plans to have a blast. I just <laughs> had one. <laughs> That's good. Thanks for chatting with me. Thank you. Well, Connected Yoga Teachers, I would love to hear what your key takeaways are. If you post them anywhere or if you want to send me a message or leave me a voicemail, you can do all of that from our website, theconnectedyogateacher.com, or you can tag me in a social media post. One of my key takeaways is this real acceptance, fascination, gratitude for this body and especially the parts of our body that we don't always send gratitude to like our fat cells and our scar tissue. So I really appreciated when Gil started talking about that. Like first, just taking a moment to say thank you when we meet that scar tissue or when we meet those fat cells. Another key takeaway that I had was this use it or lose it. So I've been trying to do this in my own life. I do a lot of sitting at the computer. I'm sure you do as well when you're working on your yoga business. And so a while ago, I had incorporated a sit-stand desk. So I definitely use that. And lately, I've also tried to stand at the counter sometimes, sit on the floor sometimes, sit on a yoga ball. And I'm looking at how I can move around. So I'm curious if you have a way that you sit when you're doing office work that really helps to invite in new movements, I would love to see a picture or hear about it. My last key takeaway is when Gil said, I don't know anything about fascia. So this is someone so many of us think of as the expert about fascia. And I love how he just said, I don't know anything. And he still has questions. So if you are feeling as a yoga teacher, like, who am I to share this? Or I don't know anything. Please know that I don't think this ever goes away. I feel like the more we learn about something, the less we feel like we know about it and the more questions we have. But you just need to know one more thing than the person that you're teaching. So when you go to a class of yoga students and you've taken your 200 hour yoga teacher training and you continue to study and to learn, you have amazing offerings to give them. Oh yeah, maybe I said that was my last key takeaway, but there's one more that just is sitting in my mind and I don't really want to weigh in on it. I want to ask you, what do you think about Gil's idea of crushing our dogmas, of inviting in new movement and really questioning the movement that we've been offered or taught or that we are teaching or we are doing? I would love to hear from you on this. How are you inviting new movement in? You know what would be really fun is if we got to meet up together in person. I will be at the Toronto Yoga Show March 29th to the 31st in 2019. And I will also be sharing Mama Nurture, my prenatal yoga teacher training in both Bermuda and Meaford, Ontario in April of 2019. Also, I'm sharing a 20-hour Yoga for Pelvic Health yoga teacher training November 2nd and 3rd in Meaford, Ontario. So if you want to find out more about those, go to theconnectedyogateacher.com. 
You can find all of the information under trainings. Thank you so much, dear Connected Yoga Teacher listeners. This podcast is coming up close to episode 100, and we are here because of you. Also, thank you to our team, Samantha, Suzanne, Crunch, and Schedulicity, for making today's episode possible. Alrighty, Connected Yoga Teachers, you've got this. It's time for me to sign off. I'm so excited for you to take this information into your own practice, into your own yoga classes, and I want to hear about it. I also want to know what will you be doing to stay connected this week to yourself, to your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. <laughs>